Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining me on episode 191 of The Virtual Couch. I'm your host, Tony Overbay. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified mindful habit coach, writer, speaker, husband, father of four, ultra marathon runner, and co-author of the best-selling book, He's a Porn Addict. Now what? An expert and a former addict to answer your questions in which I play the role of the expert and also creator of The Path Back, an online pornography recovery program that is helping people reclaim their lives once and for all from the harmful effects of pornography or any type of social social what is in my head right now, compulsive sexual behavior. And uh, if you've wanted to put that behind you once and for all, and trust me, it can be done in a strength-based hold the shame, become the person you've always wanted to be way, then please head over to pathbackrecovery.com. And there you can download a short ebook that describes five common mistakes that people make when trying to overcome pornography once and for all. Again, that is pathbackrecovery.com. It's new, it's been revamped. And why the pause, the hesitation? Why did I edit that out even though I don't like to edit anyway? I'm trying to trying to do a little video today. So I told myself, this is going to be one take. Let's just pretend that I'm speaking in front of a group. And so we're going to go blemishes, warts, and everything. So please visit, if you don't know where to find that, check out the Virtual Couch page on YouTube. And if you go over to TonyOverbay.com, actually, if you're listening to this, sure, yeah, go to TonyOverbay.com. And for this episode, episode 191, then I will have links to everything from the podcast down uh, links to also the YouTube video. And I would love it if you would subscribe and like and rate and all the things that the kids say to anywhere that you have found this podcast material. Um, just take a second and uh, click a little subscribe if you're on YouTube. That goes a long way as well. So please visit Virtual Couch on Instagram. You can find the Virtual Couch page on Facebook. But uh, one that gets a little more play there is Tony Overbay, licensed marriage and family therapist. And um, if you get a second while you're at TonyOverbay.com, um, just sign up for the newsletter if you can. I, I rarely actually send out to the newsletter, but there really, there really is a lot of exciting things that are coming up, are a lot of exciting things coming up, and I would love to keep you abreast of that also. So what a week. Um, you know, I've got a topic that I'm going to get to, and, and I haven't even decided the name of this episode yet, but you're probably already seeing that or you've seen that if you are now listening or watching to this episode. But, um, you know, just kind of going over the week and... Uh, and it was pretty crazy from the time I was trying to write a little bit of a timeline. And I feel like on Monday of last week, so that would have been Monday, the 9th of March and Tuesday, the 10th, I feel like even in my office, people were still for the most part, you know, kind of being somewhat normal, but we were starting to not shake hands. I noticed, although there were people that were going to make it a point that they were not falling prey to, you know, the hype and they wanted to shake hands and that sort of thing as well. But I had, and I didn't mean to have props, but I actually have these right in front of me. So if you're watching, I brought Clorox wipes and additional hand sanitizer to the office. And I really was trying to wipe, or not trying, I am wiping down the couch and uh, door handles, that sort of thing. So just to kind of stay on top of, of uh, this whole coronavirus thing as best as I can. And on Monday, Tuesday, again, things seem kind of normal. Wednesday, which would have been the 11th. Uh, I was I was all set to go to a basketball game. I live in Northern California around the Sacramento area, and we had tickets to go see the Sacramento Kings versus the New Orleans Pelicans. And if you are a basketball fan at all, that is a hot ticket because of Zion Williamson, who is a New, or New Orleans Pelicans rookie. So my son, two of his friends that are hilarious, uh, Jacob and Jordan, were on our way to the game, and and we hear on the way, and it, and I just it, and I'm you know probably all have these kind of feelings about what's been going on during the last week. But it was one of these surreal feelings where, you know, we just heard that, Hey, the NBA suspended the entire season after the game that we were on our way to. And we were, we were just getting off an exit off the freeway in Sacramento. And I remember just kind of feeling first, we had to verify if it was a hoax and my kids are, you know, my, my son and his friends are all on their phones and they're trying to verify. And they, they find out that uh, Woj, Woj on Twitter who breaks all stories about basketball. Woj said it was true but that the game that we were going to was literally going to be one of the last games before the season was suspended. And it was a big game that was going to be on ESPN. And so then, you know, we kind of got a little bit excited. I can't lie. So we park, we head into the arena and we grab um, food, incredibly, incredibly expensive food. And uh, I kind of little come up later here, a little foreshadowing. And then we go to our seats and we're there nice and early and the Kings players are warming up and we're all on our phones because we're reading more and more, about um, what had happened earlier in the night was at a game. I think it was the um, it was the uh, Oklahoma City Thunder and the Utah Jazz. There was uh, testing. One of the players, the Jazz players, Rudy Gobert, tested positive for the coronavirus. And right before tip off, they stopped the game. 
So I find out later, so we never saw the New Orleans Pelicans players come out. They never came out and warmed up. The Kings players were all warming up, and it's getting closer and closer. And I remember pointing out to my son, hey, uh, hey, Jake, the, um, the Pelicans haven't come out to warm up yet. And we were just kind of like, hmm, seems a little bit uh, a little bit fishy, something, more, something that we need to pay attention to. And then all of a sudden, the Kings players, with the less than 10 minutes to go, they all go into the locker room. Then we see that they're the ginormous flag that normally they unveil uh, across the, the court when they're singing the national anthem, they're marching that in. And with about three or four minutes before it is time for tip off on ESPN, uh, one of my friends texts me and he just said, you at the game? Because he knew that I, uh, we had gone to a few games this year. I said yes. And then apparently on ESPN, they had already made the announcement before they did in the arena. So it came on and said that the game had been canceled. And, uh, and while, you know, I guess we could have been bummed about the money spent, that sort of thing, uh, goes back to one of the podcasts I did long ago, shared experiences. Holy cow. We had a shared experience there of where were we the, when we heard that the NBA season had been canceled or suspended at that point. Um, sure. We had spent a ton of money on food and parking and all that stuff, but again, shared experience. So we file out of there and, uh, and then what within Thursday and Friday of last week, now we've got all kinds of things closing down. We've got the social distancing mandate. We have um, now all this talk about the possibilities uh, continuing of, of how much more do we, do we isolate uh, in order to limit the spread of the virus. And, and, and this isn't what I'm here to talk about on my podcast, but to flatten that curve. And I'm sure that by now, we all know what that concept is, and I completely understand it. I actually had several clients text and ask if we were still meeting by the end of last week. And over the weekend, I fielded a lot more texts and, uh, you know, here I am, I, I offered to clients, of obviously, if we can do online sessions, if they want to do online sessions, if they need to cancel that sort of thing. And, and so um, wanting to respect rules and, and wanting to respect this social distancing. But, uh, but, you know, I'm noticing that it is becoming more and more of something that even people are starting to um, just worry about how this is going to impact their daily lives. And I know it's because there's nothing that we have ever seen like this before. And so there's so many unknowns. That's part of what I wanted to talk about uh, on the podcast today is just what do we do with these unknowns? And, and typically, you know, why, why we follow these, the herd? Why do we have this kind of a herd mentality? And I'm not saying this in a negative way today, but here's my example is no doubt you've heard about the run on bottled water and toilet paper. And that's not just a national news story, but it's also a day-to-day -day story as well. And I found a lot of people last week that were saying that they were going to, and they would typically start it by, I know this is kind of odd, but you know, I'm gonna go, even though I don't necessarily need a lot of things from the store, I find myself wanting to go and buy things, especially toilet paper and bottled water. And, and a lot of people were kind of bringing up the same thing. A, that some already had bottled water, but uh, what I was even hearing more of was, was B, that a lot of people had filtered water from their fridge or tap water that they drank from regularly. So it, it was kind of like this, well, if everybody else is doing it, then I better do it as well. That there was, that's the kind of the follow the herd mentality that I was talking about. So I thought for today's podcast, I wanted to just do a little bit of digging. I found a couple of studies that talk more articles that talk more about, should you do what everyone else is doing and why? And so of course there are going to be situations where that is absolutely necessary. When we are talking about trying to slow down a pandemic worldwide, then it is a, of course, a good idea to, to listen to those who know more than we do and, uh, and who, especially the infectious disease experts or some of those that if you're like me, if you've been all over YouTube or if you've been all over just uh, news site after news site, you know, you start to hear kind of a united voice for the most part of the social distancing and being able to, to flatten this curve and the importance of that. But, but so that's not, you know, that's not my job. That's not my podcast today. But what I want to talk about a little bit more is to spend a couple of minutes talking about should you do what every, everyone else is doing. So the first article I want to talk about is one from psychology, both today that I'm referring to are from psychology today. This one is by Jeremy Nicholson. He's a PhD. And it's called Should You Do What Everyone Else Is Doing? This one was posted in March of 2019. So uh, in the, it wasn't too long ago when this one was posted. I'm sure little did Jeremy know that uh, it would be used, this article would be kind of referenced in a time like today. So he said, when making a decision, it's, uh, it's a common impulse to look and see what others are doing. Nevertheless, it's often unclear whether a, the, the path that everybody else might be doing is good for us as well. After all, sometimes following the crowd has merit. At other times, it's simply peer pressure that is blinding us. 
And so the phenomenon, he says, of looking to others and following the crowd has been studied by social science for a long time. So I wanted to, to look at some of those, some of these, um, the way it's been studied and what some of those results find. So he talks about some of the research on social norms, conformity, and following others. So to start, individuals tend to look to the opinions of others, especially when they're unsure and lack information from other sources, which I think is a safe place to say that a lot of us are operating from right now. This dynamic was supported by classic research, and he goes back as far as 1937 for this first bit of research, and we'll kind of bring some more up to date here a little bit later in this podcast. So 1937 by Sharif, he explored how a person's perception of a very ambiguous stimuli can be influenced by the opinion of others. So in 1937, this researcher Sharif asked participants to watch a small light in a dark and featureless room and evaluate how much that light moved around. And in actuality, as you can maybe guess where this one's going, the light never moved at all. But the way our perception works in that situation gives the possible illusion of movement, which that in, in itself is called the autokinetic effect. But so in this uncertain and what he likes to say ambiguous perceptual situation, Sharif found that individuals were quite susceptible to the influence of the opinions of others when trying to decide how much the light was moving. And that this was particularly true when those others claimed to be more certain of their opinions too. So in that research, I did a little more digging on this. So if you felt like that light really wasn't moving, but then you said to somebody, you know, somebody near you, I don't know, what do you think? And if they're saying, I think it's moving, then you're like, yeah, yeah, I think it is too. That it's really hard for us. It's very rare that we say, um, I don't know, what do you think? I need bottled water. And they're like, I'm getting bottled water. And like, yeah, I'm getting bottled water too. That it's rare for us to be the person that says, I'm not getting bottled water. Or the person who says, that line's not moving. And, and I think we even know certain types of people, and maybe you are one of those types of people, that are the, I'm not getting any bottled water, I'm good. Or the, that line is not moving. I don't care what you say, that line is not moving. And unfortunately, he says this effect doesn't end just with ambiguous and uncertain situations. It also extends to individuals following the crowd. So um, in this next part, uh, Jeremy Nicholson shares a study that was done um, and he said this extends to, to others following a crowd, even um, when they can clearly see what others are doing is wrong. This was first evaluated by a researcher named Ash in 1955, who asked participants to pick a line from a few choices of varying lengths that matched up with another example line given to them. So from a perceptual standpoint, the task was easy, as the correct choice of which lines were actually similar to one another was clear. There was an absolute, these lines are, are the same. Um, nevertheless, when participants were surrounded by other individuals giving the wrong answer, they often conformed and made the wrong choice as well. How fascinating is that, right? They would even know that, no, that line is the same as the other line. But when everybody around them is going, well, it's obviously this one, then a lot of times they're going, yeah, yeah, it is. I think it's that line, that line as well. So uh, that's even when the correct choice is clear and what others are doing is wrong, that peer pressure can still cause us to doubt ourselves and follow the crowd. So again, if we're talking about something like bottled water and I have filtered water at home, that's one thing. There's, there's, you know, if we are following the crowd, but the crowd is following what is given to us as, as the advice that we need by medical experts, I, I'm not calling into question that, you know, that is a good thing. The social distancing is a good thing. The, uh, the washing our hands to the tune of ABCs or happy birthday, that is a amazing and fantastic thing. But the, I need to get more bottled water because everybody else is getting more bottled water. That one's maybe one that we can take a look at. So uh, Jeremy Nicholson says, why is it then that we're so compelled to follow the crowd, even when it's objectively clear that they are wrong? So according to more recent research, we might simply be wired that way. I thought this was the part that became very, very fascinating. Specifically, these social influences can actually change our perceptions and memories. And this was by a study in 2011 by Edelson, Sherratt, Dolan, and Dudai. So therefore, rather than knowingly making the wrong choice just to conform to peer pressure, the influence of others may actually change what we see as the correct choice in the moment and remember it as the right thing after the fact. There's that uh, wonderful brain kind of filling in the gaps, right? So beyond that, we might just have what he calls herding brains with built-in components that monitor our social alignments and make us feel good when we want to follow the crowd too. So fortunately, uh, Jeremy says this effect has good points as well. In many cases, the group decision-making can help individuals look beyond their own private perspectives and make more rational decisions. That's from Farr and, and Erlenbush in 2011. And furthermore, more pro-social and altruistic behaviors can be influenced and shared through such conformity as well. And that was a pretty fascinating uh, research um, by uh, it's Nook, Ong, Morelli, and Mitchell and Zaki in 2016. And that one 
um, that research goes on to show that you oftentimes, if you feel, let's just say that you feel more giving and then those around you are also more giving, then you'll have a tendency to then take upon these giving behaviors as well. So it, the herd mentality doesn't mean that it's always the negative. They can also be positive as well. I, I was listening to something this morning that talked about a lot of people that are, are donating to food banks now. And the more that people are getting the message out to donate to food banks, the more people are donating to food banks, which then is a great opportunity right now for me to say, if you are in a position to do so, um, just Google food bank in your area. And there, there are some websites that are um, set up to help you donate to local food banks. So given all of this information, it's uh, Jeremy goes on to give a couple of things to pay attention to, which I, I wanted to go through. He said some simple steps can help you figure it out. Number one, he just says stop and think. So getting uh, swept away by what everybody else is thinking and doing um, is often what he calls an emotional and thoughtless process. Um, we're conforming simply because we haven't been given sufficient attention and we haven't given the sufficient attention and effort toward considering any other options. So, and I, I know I keep going back to this bottled water thing, but that's just a, it's just a great example of, do I have bottled water? Do I need bottled water? Do I have filtered water? Um, I ran into a friend of mine who runs a pool service business at, uh, uh, over the weekend, and he mentioned, you know, you can drink all the water out of your pool just through a simple filter that you can get at, you know, a store for 10 or 15 bucks. So I thought that was fascinating as well. So nevertheless, he says, when making decisions, there's usually time to stop and think about the options more carefully. And I think that's part really what we're seeing a little bit of is that what I saw people talking about last week, and I got caught up in a little bit of it too, grab, jumping on Amazon, what do I need to order? And I kind of couldn't even think of some of the things to order. But the, everybody else is ordering everything. They're getting all the water. They're getting all the toilet paper. I mean, I got to get my water and toilet paper too. And uh, therefore, unless you're in an emergency situation and need to immediately um, follow everybody else to the nearest exit, and I like how he's saying that, unless it's that kind of a situation, it might be a good idea to switch to a more deliberate thinking process rather than just going with your initial reaction. And, uh, but again, I want, for the record, noted, uh, I, I understand completely that this is an emergency situation. This is a worldwide pandemic. But I had, uh, I saw someone um, tweet over the weekend and I thought it was very true and clever where they were saying that, you know, someone in their family had bought a whole bunch of avocados and they don't necessarily always buy the avocados, but they felt like the scarcity mentality, I need more avocados. So then they were kind of saying, hey, but we just took away avocados for people that really like maybe love avocados, they care more about avocados. So sometimes in the scarcity mentality, we do just say, all right, what do I got to get? What can I get? I will buy whatever right now because everyone else is buying things. And so if that isn't something that truly is, is something that you need, then is this an opportunity to then switch to a more deliberate thinking process, as he says, instead of just going with that initial reaction. Uh, the second thing that Jeremy talked about is looking at all the information. So as noted above, what we talked about before, he says, we tend to look for the opinion of others when we're uncertain and when we don't have sufficient information to make a decision and when choices are unclear to us. Nevertheless, more objective facts, statistics, measurements, and evaluations are also sources of potential decision-making information, as are our own perceptions and personal needs and morals and values. So therefore, all he's kind of saying is a little bit of a, just a check-in with yourself, that it's great to gather data of all of those things going on around you. But uh, in addition to that, what other people are thinking, consider those objective and individual sources as well. So um, he said, quite frankly, and I thought this was interesting too, if factual information indicates that a choice is not good and it's bad for you personally, then following the crowd is not a good idea. After all, as mothers used to say, this is, we know where this one's coming next, just because everybody else jumps off a bridge doesn't mean you should too. So just because everybody else is getting the water and toilet paper doesn't necessarily mean that you need it, especially if you have a lot of water and toilet paper already. Um, he says, consider the specific situation. This is the third recommendation he had. And this is where I think this is a little bit more important right now. Some choices and decision-making situations are more individual, while others are more social. Similarly, sometimes our goals are better served by fitting in with the group, while on other occasions, going it alone might be more successful. And uh, overall, if we're balancing what we're balancing between what is best for ourselves and what's best for others too, um, individual decisions leaning one way or the other, therefore, it can be very important to consider the specific situation and how you fit into that. In this, in this pandemic right now, we know that the, uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, this affects the elderly and the immunocompromised. If you are not elderly and not immunocompromised, then again, go back to those, uh, the standards of uh, today's podcast. Um, do you need as much of the bottled water or toilet paper? Um, which by the way, my, my brain was going nuts over the weekend just thinking about, you know, we were at, my wife and I were, we did stop by at Costco and we, so we needed an eye exam. So uh, to be fair, 
And I heard people talking about that earlier in the day, there had been a line completely around the building. And if you wanted toilet paper and water, there was a separate line and they were sold out by 11 o'clock and the next batch wouldn't come until I think Wednesday of, uh, in, in a few days. And I did think about, man, there's gonna be some clever people coming up with uh, toilet paper alternatives. And all I could go with were leaves and that sort of thing. And then also maybe uh, harken back to the days when I used to travel a lot. And uh, man, if you've never um, been privy to a bidet, there's something you need to look up as well. Number four, seek out multiple perspectives. Um, he goes on to say a one-sided way of looking at things often leads to biased and poor decision-making. I've done a couple of episodes on uh, confirmation bias. So a lot of times what we tend to do is just look for information that supports what we already believe and then just notice and believe a whole lot more of that information. So he said that therefore it's generally a good idea to evaluate your choices and decisions from multiple perspectives. I think that's a good idea for most of it, or all of us. Uh, he said the same is true following the opinion of others too, although it might not feel that way at times, especially in the modern day of media coverage and social networking. He, he says everyone, quote, is not doing it, whatever it is that you're considering. So given that, uh, before you follow the advice or choices of any particular group of people, it might be a good idea to look at what other groups of people are doing or choosing as well, especially those who are going in the opposite direction. And, and I like this point in particular. In fact, we can learn more from people making choices contrary to ourselves or our preferred group, particularly about the potential downsides to choices we might not be seeing. Therefore, if you do need to look to others to help provide information regarding a particular choice or decision, then it might actually help to seek out people with a few different opinions weigh your options among them and figure out what will work best for you. Again, I appreciate uh, Jeremy Nicholson, um, PhD, for his comments on that article. So I'll, I'll do a quick second article and then we'll kind of wrap things up right now because I know there's a, a lot of things out there to, to listen to, to read, to watch. Um, the next one comes from a person named Rob Henderson. This is also from a Psychology Today article and it's called The Science Behind Why People Follow the Crowd and Why Do Other People Influence Us So Much? And I skipped to a little bit more into the middle of his article but he's just saying, if other people do it, that means it's right, right? Which is, I think, obviously um, a, little bit, uh, a little bit being facetious there. He says, there's a heuristic, and then just for fun, I wasn't quite sure what a heuristic was. A heuristic in psychology is a mental shortcut that allows people to solve problems and make judgments quickly and efficiently. And examples of heuristics are trial and error, rule of thumb, educated guess, intuitive judgment. So he says, there's a heuristic, um, uh, that most of us use to determine what to do or think or say and buy. He said it's the principle we call of social proof. To learn what is correct, we look at what other people are doing. And, and this is why I particularly went to this article because then he quotes a lot from a book called Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. And that is a book by psychologist Robert Cialdini. And um, Robert writes, whether the question is what to do with an empty popcorn box in a movie theater how fast to drive on a certain stretch of highway, or how to eat the chicken at a dinner party, the actions of those around us will be important in defining the answer. Social proof is a shortcut to decide to help us decide on how to act. So uh, Cialdini has used the principle of social proof to prevent environmental theft. This is a really fascinating study. He said, consider the case of Arizona's Petrified Forest National Park. Visitors would arrive at the park and learn of past thievery from prominent signs. The sign, for example, saying, your heritage is being vandalized every day by theft losses of petrified wood of 14 tons a year, mostly a small piece at a time. So that sign is what you are met with when you typically enter Arizona's Petrified Forest National Park. So in one experiment, uh, Cialdini removed the sign from a specific path in the park to measure any differences that it might make. So we removed the sign that says people are stealing this much every year. So the path with no sign had one third less theft than the path with the sign. Visitors interpreted the sign's message as permission. So he goes on to say, put differently, visitors thought that it was normal to take small pieces of wood because so much was being stolen every year. And I think, and, and people have responded as I was truly hoping, but if, you, if you're hearing this episode and you haven't listened to the episode I did last week on psychological reactants, please go find that episode. That has become my favorite phrase, my favorite word. And I think this plays into that as well. Psychological reactance is the instantaneous negative reaction we have when being told what to do. And it goes deep, my friends. I mean, this is the, it's called change resistance in business. It's called the terrible twos in parenting. And we even do it in our own brains that at times if we're like, I shouldn't be doing that. It's almost like your brain says, yeah, you should. Or if you're saying, you know, you should do that. That's where the brain goes. No, you shouldn't. 
So this psychological reactance is huge, and, and that's, uh, that's something that I was so excited to share, so please go find that episode last week. So back to, back to um, this article. So researchers have also used the principle to study uh, social proof to help people overcome their fears. So in one study, Albert Bandura and his colleagues worked with a group of young children frightened of dogs. Um, the children watched a four-year-old boy happily play with a dog for 20 minutes a day for four days. After the four-day period, 67% of the children who watched the boy play with the dog were willing to enter a playpen with the dog. So when the researchers conducted a follow-up study one month later, they found the same children were willing to play with a dog. So watching a little boy have fun with the dog reduced that fear in children. The more, so they use that behavior of the boy playing with a dog as a model to change their own behavior. So that leads to the question, then why do others then influence so much? Talked a little bit about that earlier with the previous article, um, but clearly, uh, as he goes on to say, others affect our behavior. One reason for this is that we live in a complex world. He said we use the decisions of others as a heuristic or a mental shortcut to navigate our lives. English philosopher and mathematician Albert North, uh, Alfred North Whitehead once said, civilization advances by extending the number of operations we can perform without thinking about them. And I think this is fascinating. The reason I like this article is um, if, if you go way back, uh, one of the first episodes I did was on talking about you know, the brain and habits. Charles Duhigg in his book, The Power of Habit, uh, really taught me much about the, uh, the basal ganglia or the habit center of the brain. And what's fascinating is that the more that we do things, tie our shoe, back our car out of the driveway, that our brain says, I got this. And why, why is that so important? Because the brain wants to work on the least amount of electrical activity possible. It believes that if it can work on the least amount of electrical activity possible, that it will live forever. So the more things become habitual, the more we put them into this basal ganglia or habit center of our brain, and then the less, the less uh, electricity, elect the less power the brain requires to, to do tasks, repetitive tasks or repetitive thoughts um, when it's pulling them out of this habit center or this basal ganglia. So I think it's safe to kind of make that leap that we often will follow these social norms or follow people that seem to know what they're doing because we want to mindlessly follow. And I feel like the brain in a sense is saying, hey, where's path of least resistance? You know, where can I go? Um, who can I follow? What can I do that then I don't really have to think a lot about it? And, and I find that in acceptance and commitment therapy all the time. This is that thing where I, I love giving the example of somebody hears somebody give a talk about running a marathon often. They're like, man, I'm doing it. I'm running a marathon. And the brain will even throw a little bit of dopamine there. And, and you go, yeah. And then the brain immediately comes back with these reasons why that won't work. It's like, well, you don't really have a training partner. You've never really done one before. Um, you don't even know where a marathon is, or I, I think I've read that it can hurt your knees or this sort of thing. So our brain constantly wants path of least resistance. And again, bless its squishy pink heart. It thinks it's doing that so it can live forever. So um, back to this, uh, but it talks about in his book, um, this, this book about uh, uh, influence. Um, now I just drew a blank. I want to, I want to give him the proper credit. Oh, influence the psychology of persuasion. Um, in this, uh, in his book, influence, Cialdini uses the example of advertisers informing us that a product is the fastest growing or best selling. He said, advertisers don't have to persuade us that a product is good. They only need to say others think so. I am as guilty of it as anybody. I happen to have my, uh, a copy of my book right here. Um, he's a porn addict. Now what? Uh, an expert and a former addict to answer your questions. And it is, it is, it is a best-selling book. We have been number one in the sexual health and recovery category um, many, many weeks. And so I, I, I say it with great pride, I'm afraid, that it's a best-selling book. And, and he's right. Cialdini is right that the, the research shows that when somebody hears it's a best-selling book, often they go, well, okay. And I don't know how many times you've been on Amazon looking around. If it says Amazon's bestseller, a lot of times I'm, I'll think, okay, well, I'll, I'll go with that one then. I just did it with... Uh, Pumpkin seeds, for Pete's sake. You know, I'm um, uh, like those little pumpkin seeds, pepitas or whatever. There's so many of them that are the same, but then the one that says Amazon's choice, I was like, that must be the best, even though I think we're talking pumpkin seeds. I think they're pretty much the same. Maybe they're even uh, put together in the same place. I would say bottled, but they're in a bag. Bagged. Maybe they're bagged in the same place, but I go with the one that says Amazon's best. So, um, so you know, he, he notes that that's, uh, that's a pretty simple heuristic shortcut. There's our word for the day, right? Um, popular is good. That is a very short heuristic. Following the crowd allows us to function in a complicated environment. Most of us don't have the time to increase our knowledge of all merchandise and research every advertised item to measure its usefulness. Um, instead, we rely on signals like popularity. So if everybody else is buying something, the reasoning goes, there's a good chance the item is worth our intention. But I, 
I would, I was about to say, I guarantee you, but I feel it is a safe bet to say that if you're like me, you've had a time or two or many where you have bought the most recommended product and it wasn't quite for you. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you had this experience where you see a whole lot of ratings and stars, but then when you read the reviews, you find out that, you know, maybe a lot of the most recent reviews aren't really as favorable as some of the ones earlier. Maybe there's been a change in packaging, a change in formula, a change in um, ingredients, whatever that, that may be. But he also said a second reason others influence us is that humans are social. We have survived because of our ability to band together. This is very important. This is what we need to do right now is band together. Early humans who form groups were more likely to survive, and this affected our psychology. Um, as Julia Kultis, a researcher at the University of Essex, puts it, for an individual joining a group, copying the behavior of the majority would then be a sensible adaptive behavior. A conformist tendency would facilitate acceptance into the group and would probably lead to survival if it involved the decision. For instance, to choose between a nutritious or poisonous food based on copying the behavior of the majority. I love that example. Back in, in those times, a uh, person eats poisonous food, they die. A um, person eats a uh, different food, they live. We, we follow the person who lived. Um, and so that is part of our evolutionary biology. He says, in our evolutionary past, our ancestors were under constant threat. Keen awareness of others helped our ancestors survive in a dangerous and uncertain world. And as modern humans, we have inherited such adaptive behaviors. So those behaviors include banding together and promoting social harmony. This includes not dissenting from a group and a hunter-gatherer group being ostracized or banished could have been a death sentence. So thoughtful reflection on social influence may lead us to greater awareness of ourselves and our relationships with others. So I, I, you know, I hope you gathered a little bit from today. Uh, do you need the bottled water? Do you need the extra toilet paper? I am not one to judge. If you do, go get them. But I think that uh, today we've kind of learned a little bit of why, why we do follow the crowd. Um, you know, why it is so important to us uh, that, or why we, you know, should we do what every, everybody else is doing and why we tend to gravitate to, to doing so. So if you stuck with me so far, I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time. Um, if you have any other thoughts, suggestions, ideas, you can shoot me an email at contact at tonyoverbay.com or there's a form on the tonyoverbay.com website. And I don't give this enough credit, but the, uh, the song that I play as I'm going out is a song that I think is, uh, is something we really need to continue to embrace right now. Is, is, it's, it's wonderful. It's by Aurora Florence. You can find it on um, iTunes, wherever else you can get your music. But that's going to take us away today. And I will see you next time on The Virtual Catch. Compressed emotions flying past Our heads and out the other end The pressures of the daily grind It's wonderful Elastic waste and rubber ghost I'm floating past the midnight hour They push aside the things that matter most It's wonderful Heal the legs and hearts you move.